Okay, so let me start with an observation that has also been implicitly made by all my preceding speakers, that of all British Romantic writers, William Blake has inspired by far the most musical settings of his work. This rich musical reception has produced, and we've already also heard about that, classically composed, that is to say, written instances. But in the final decades of the 20th century, the mu musical productivity sparked by Blake's works has increased and can be moved into realms of music in Christopher Small's sense that are no longer based on written compositions in musical notation, and uh, Camilla has talked about that. Instead, these musical settings rely on codification and conventionalization in performance and are then turned into texts by means of recordings. Perhaps closest to Blake's own alleged practice of composing tunes for his songs and occasionally singing them to his friends uh, comes Songs of Innocence and Experience by William Blake, tuned by Allen Ginsberg, originally recorded between 1968 and 1971 and collected and made digitally available in 2017, and Camilla talked about that too. Of more interest to me, however, are the various performances of the recordings in jazz, folk, rock and pop idioms that have been produced since then, and Camilla has also shown many of those. But my take will be slightly different, but I think we should get together, Camilla. <laughs> um, what is it in Blake Works, is my question today, that has led to this musical flowering? Why is there nothing comparable for his contemporaries? In my presentation, I will try to sketch the conceptual framework that may provide some clues for answering these questions. So let me bypass the booming literature that charts Blake's musical reception in order to focus on some foundational coordinates. Where there are some obvious cues in terms of genres, such as the designation songs and the title of the songs of innocence and of experience, this is also the case with some of the works of Blake's contemporaries. The title Lyrical Ballad springs to mind. There are also songs to be found in the oeuvres of Shelley and Byron, and the latter also provides stanzas for music in 1816. Um, what is more, not all of the texts Blake said to music by music in recent years are from the songs of innocence and of experience. So what are the deeper reasons, if you like, for this affinity? Uh, and I think uh, Carolyn gave us a hint with uh, the attractiveness of Blake's oppositionality earlier this afternoon. So that's part of it, but I want to get it in a more technical sense. So my answer will be twofold. Can I have the next slide, please? First, it seems that there is something in what we know about Blake's artistic practice that provides an opening for the active mode of reception that is so characteristic of the manifold artistic responses to his work, including the musical ones. And second, this active mode of aesthetic attachment, which even extends beyond artistic responses to include mere readers, anticipates an understanding of how modern culture works, which has only become prominent in recent years. On the basis of this double answer, we can then return to the role of genres and musical responses to William Blake. Let me elaborate. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, Mac this 2015 monograph reading William Blake provides a suitable access point for my project. This revisionist study tries to move beyond the tradition of learned or strictly historicist commentary that has been so prominent in Blake's studies, very much in line with a strong tradition of active responses to Blake that I mentioned earlier. MacDizzy's book wants to enable its readers to experience a more direct and immediate access to Blake's works. It does so by identifying key ideas in Blake's practice and discussing their implications for readers then and now. The key ideas identified by McGee are image, text, desire, joy, power, time, and making. And from the book, the following overall scheme can be drawn. Um, next slide, please. I cannot discuss this extensively here, but I want you to look at it while I supplement some programmatic quotes from McGee's book. According to McGee, the core of Blake's poetics lies in his awareness of the foundational function of mediality in modern culture. I'm quoting him, at the very peak of the Industrial Revolution, Blake invented a method of printing that stood the logic of industrial production on its head and its technologies to slowly and laboriously produce a stream of handcrafted artworks that bore 
no relation whatsoever to the endless flood of cheap mass-produced commodities that was already beginning to wash over England and the rest of the world, end of quote. With this printing method, Blake produced books that were and still are, and I'm quoting MacDesey again, critiquing the concept of the book, end of quote, books that were, quote, exploding the very logic of the book itself, books that MacDesey then proceeds to call unbooks. In producing these unbooks, Blake, and I'm quoting again, refuses the very possibility of a self-enclosed self-referential logic, the logic of commandment and the mode of reading associated with it, and insists instead on the need for us to trace and retrace our own interpretive path by linking together the bits and pieces, the constituent elements of which it is imminently composed." End of quote. Obviously, this project of unbooking modern print culture is truly prophetic, though not in the religious sense that Blake would claim for himself. It is prophetic in that it anticipates modern culture's expansion from print into multimedia and finally digital culture. And at the same time, it is highly attractive for individuals, artists or not, through its claims of countercultural relevance. So uh, Carolyn's uh, notion of oppositionality comes in here. This then, it seems to me, is the grounding for the multifarious active activity that Blake has inspired in later generations. And this brings me to the second part of my answer, the modes of reception afforded by this. Um, next slide, please. So second part is making and aesthetic attachment. Um, the core element in MacDesey's media-grounded reconstruction of Blake's prophetic poetics is making. Someone calling me? Okay, so making. Here's another chart, next slide please, which indicates how this affects reception. Well, academic reception remains largely reading and as book-centered, though in immediately upgraded form as the wonderful William Blake, William Blake archive, for example, shows and perhaps also our conference now. Artistic reception has clearly proven to be alert to the dimension of making and has responded to it in kind. Popular reception, finally, and here I refer to popular music in particular, has been caught in between. I base this assessment on musicologist Ellen of Moore's seminal study, Song Means, analyzing and interpreting recorded popular song. Next slide, please. In which he distinguishes three key terms, song, performance, and track which map onto the three dimensions of composition, performance, and recording um, I introduced at the beginning of my talk. While making, in Blake's sense, refers to his integrated mode of writing, edging, printing, coloring, and binding, which transform the print, transforms the print culture induced abstraction of the category back into concrete and unique individual copies, as opposed to the standardized copies of mechanical reproduction, the media regime of recorded popular song relegates the song to a similarly abstract status because it actually refers to the elements held in common by all recorded performances. In this sense, performing and recording replace writing as the predominant mode of making, resulting in concrete and unique copies, tracks, which are nevertheless endlessly reproducible, and this is the in between I mentioned earlier. Recorded, I could say, preserve remnants of making in a similar vein to Blake's unbooks, but they are at the same time mechanically and digitally reproducible. From here, various analytical and interpretive dimensions are unfolded by Moore, and again, I can only very briefly touch upon this as I go along. For our purposes, it is important to note that in the context of rock and pop music, it is the track that provides the main entry point for audiences and is then only supplemented by attendance live performances. Meanwhile, the song is as an individual and more or less active construction of an abstract entity on this basis. Musical settings of William Blake's works in this context emerges interesting instantiations of an open-ended process of diachronic cultural resonance in the sense introduced by Y.G. Dimmock in 1997 and queued for Blake's studies in my Goods influential essay, Blake's Walking in 2006. And I'm equally thrilled um, not to only follow on 
go on Giltra, but uh, to be followed by my good later today. So this is quite a nice event for me. This open-ended process clearly builds on Blake's prophetic unbooking of modern culture, which in turn prefigures the updated understanding of interpretation outlined by Stephen Connor in 2014. According to Connor, interpretation should no longer ask, what does an object mean, as was required by modern book culture, but it should reinvent itself to ask more processual and performative questions that supplement first order, the second order modes of observation and reading. Connor's words, the question is, what are the implications of what it might mean? What does what it means mean? If academic reception wants to profit from this insight, it perhaps needs to follow suit and incorporate aesthetic experience into the analytical and interpretive work of the humanities much more explicitly, as, next slide please, Rita Felsky has recently argued. Besides textual analysis, hermeneutical understanding in the traditional sense and historical explanation, Felsky calls for a full acknowledgement and explanation of the modes of aesthetic attachment on which ostensibly objective academic scrutiny in the humanities is inevitably built. In Felsky's understanding, aesthetic attachment emerges from a coming together of contingent factors in the registers of attunement, identification, and interpretation, which, if fully acknowledged in their interplay, may lay the ground for another instance of making, be it an artistic response or, in fully explicated fashion, the writing of an academic piece. Which brings us finally to genre. Next slide, please. So what about the implications of genre and genre in the context of popular music, I would argue has a lot to do with the notion of authenticity and authenticity is perhaps more profitably thought of as a process of authentication, which has nothing to do with anything that rests in the object at stake, but which is something which emerges from the process itself. In the understanding outlined so far, every act of reception is the coming together of a myriad of contingent factors, while paradoxically, the coming together itself, once it has happened, is a crucial ingredient in modern individual strategies for coping with contingency. Against this backdrop, genres can be conceived of as strategies for increasing the probability of this coming together by helping to turn contingency into cultural performances of authenticity. Understood in this way, it becomes clear that authenticity is not something that can be found in the world, but that emerges from processes of authentication, as Alan wrote out very early in his career. And these processes can in part be speculatively reconstructed by way of attention to more or less generic features of songs, performances and tracks in the various dimensions of Moore's analytical and interpretive grid on the one hand, and by way of attention to Felsky's registers of attunement, identification and interpretation on the part of the audience on the other. So, let us in conclusion briefly consider these processes of authentication in musical settings of Blake's The Echoing Green. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so, in addition to the two versions presented by Song Green at the beginning, and I think one mentioned uh, while we're underway, uh, these are the three which I had actually uh, already kind of focused upon when I realized that somebody else was going to talk about the echoing room too, but now I think this rounds the panel off quite nicely. And I highly recommend uh, that you check out these versions, uh, but I will not play them for reason time. So what kind of authentication through musicians' reception and ensuing production would we expect here? In response to cues by the poem itself, which we have already seen, a musical setting which somehow implies a rural community would be most likely. And indeed, there are two folk versions, which however could not be more different from each other. White American Greg Brown's blues inflected but lilting band version from 1986. And Native American, African American, European descended Martha Rebecca Mountain Holler from 2012. With the help of the approach sketched here, a comparison of these two versions in terms of their correlation of what Moore called first-person authenticity of expression, 
second person authenticity of experience and third person authenticity of execution can be used as a framework for speculating on the track's potential for letting things come together for listeners in an unbooked culture, or perhaps more precisely, in a culture that for a moment is perceived to be unbooked, because I don't think we are yet fully in an unbooked culture, though perhaps we're getting there um, with digitalization. And in the second step, the comparison can then be extended to include rock versions like Norwegian Finn Correns from 1997, which opens up a different horizon of possible attachments and is more self-reflexive in terms of its mediality, thus shifting the emphasis from performance, as in the two earlier instances, to recording as the focus of making. These readings, and please, next slide, these readings will work out how the oral shape of the recording, the delivery and voice of the singer and the musical form that is given to the lyrics open up opportunities for authentications of belonging, identity and reference that in turn afford opportunities of attunement, identification and interpretation to listeners on a spectrum from entertainment and commodification to the visionary and artistic. But I'm afraid I cannot do this in 15 minutes. Next slide, thank you very much.